Welcome to Worship with St. John United Church of Christ. Know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I want to just let you know a few of the things that are happening here at St. John 405 South 5th Street and encourage you to participate in them as much as you are comfortable and able to do so. We have two things that are happening on our, our, our parking lot all through the week. One is our cross scavenger hunt, which I talked about last week. That continues to go on. And the other is that we are going to have some stations of the cross, uh, a spiritual journey that will be set up behind St. John Hall attached to the railings there. So I encourage you to come by at your own convenience and experience both of those things. We have services this week. Monday, Thursday is going to be online. It's going to be uh, a couple different cantatas put together and remembering the um, Last Supper and Crucifixion of Jesus. For Good Friday, all our services are going to be live and inside the sanctuary. We will have one at noon and one at 7.15. That odd start time is so that we will um, begin in light, but we will end in darkness. So hope that you will come for those. Holy Saturday at 8 p.m. is going to be on the parking lot around fire pits. It's going to be a little bit different from our normal service of Easter Vigil, but I think it'll be a meaningful service and hope that you will show up for that as well. And then on Easter Sunday, we will have nine o'clock service in the sanctuary and we will have 1030 service in the parking lot. The nine o'clock service is going to be streamed and uploaded for those of you who will be watching online at 1030. I'm also going to throw up a service from um, 2018 as a sunrise service on Facebook. Uh, that is a little bit of nostalgia, and it's also to give you something just in case all the technology wizards uh, go bonkers again this year. There'll be something for you to view on Easter Sunday. If you're listening through KWRE radio next Sunday on Easter, you also will be getting the 2018 Easter service. There's so much going on. It's hard to believe it's been a year since we've been together, but we are getting through this together and God goes with us. Let us worship God.
Amen. Good evening, St. John. Let us prepare our hearts for our call to worship. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage in Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a coat tied near a door outside in the street. As they were to untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the coat? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Let us hold our palm in our hands as we do the blessing of the palms. O oh God, who in Jesus Christ triumphantly entered Jerusalem, heralding a pain, a week of pain and sorrow, be with us now as we follow the way of the cross. In these events of defeat and victory, you have sealed the closeness of death and resurrection, of humiliation and exaltation. We thank you for these branches that promise to become for us symptoms of martyrdom and majesty. Bless them and us 
that their use this day may announce in our time that Jesus Christ has come and that Christ will come again. Amen. Come, Christ Jesus. For our children's time today, I am going to teach you how to weave a palm branch into a cross. This year for Palm Sunday, we only got the, the smaller branches that you can wave around. We don't have any of the big, long palms, but I'm going to show you with a piece of construction paper. And construction paper is probably something you have at home. So cut yourself a big, long piece, as long as you can get it. And you might want to make it a little thicker at one end and a little more narrow at the other. And I'm going to show you how you do this. So you start by just folding down a little bit of the long end. And then you bring this up. And if you can see, you go up to that place where you had the other. So that's your up and down part of your cross. It looks like that. And then you're going to kind of make a triangle. And you're going to fold it like that. See how that is? So it's kind of coming off at an angle. And now you're going to make the cross piece of your cross. So you wrap that around like that. And then you wrap this back around like so. And now you've got it so it looks like a cross. But if I take my fingers off, it all is going to just fall apart. And you still have this dangly stuff here. So now you do this again. You bend it again. And now you're going to use this to wrap. And that's where it works much better on a real, real uh, palm branch than it does with paper. But we're just going to wrap that around on the diagonal like that. And then flip it around the back and we'll wrap it on the diagonal here. So it looks like that. See how that looks? And now you can just tuck it in the back. You take that little piece that's left and you can tuck it in the back. And you have a palm cross and it, it stays together without any glue or tape or anything like that. I always liked doing that during church service when I was a kid. We would always have those long palms and I would spend part of my church time making crosses out of the palms. Maybe that's not the best thing for me to have done as a kid. Maybe I should have been paying attention to the sermon a little bit more. But I like this idea of turning a palm branch into a cross because that's what really happened in the story of Jesus's life. He came into town on Palm Sunday and people saw him and they didn't like it. And so they reported it to other people. And they said, this guy's pretending to be a king, made up all these stories. And those things, little by little, led them to persecute Jesus and put him to death on a cross. So we turn our palms into crosses to remember that Palm Sunday, while it's a lot of fun to raise our branches, it led to something really sad, which is Jesus dying on a cross. But here's the good news. Next week will be Easter, and I know there'll be chocolate and jelly beans and all sorts of fun things like that. But the really good news is that the story didn't end with Jesus dying on a cross. The story went forward from there, from a cross to an empty tomb, because after Jesus died and was in the tomb for a couple days, um, when the women come, they find that the stone is rolled away and the tomb is empty and Jesus is risen. So we turn our palm branches into crosses, but we remember that the cross isn't the final word, that good things are waiting for us on Easter. Let us worship together. And um, if you want, take some time to, to bend some palm branches into crosses during the service.
from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 1 through 10. It was two days before the Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there will be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came in with an alabaster jar a very costly ointment of nard, and she broke it open, the jar, and poured the ointment over his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her know, why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas I carried, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Blessed be to God. If you wonder what kind of discussion pastors have with each other, especially when they're spouses who are married to each other, I will tell you that most of what we talk about are things like whose turn it is to do the dishes, who's picking up what kid when, and other things that are replicated in households all over the place. However, every now and then, the conversations run a little bit deeper and we argue about something because of, of something that is belief-oriented. And so one of the things that we argue about is this song called Walking in Memphis, which was written and sung by Mark Cohn. Um, you may have heard Cher do a cover of it later. Um, I love this song. Jim hates this song. And the reason Jim hates this song and the reason I love this song is one of the later verses. It says, Muriel plays piano every Friday at the Hollywood. They took me down to see her and they asked me if I would play a little number and I sang with all my might. She said, tell me if you're a Christian child. And I said, ma'am, I am tonight. Mm -hmm. Jim hates this lyric. He, he will go on and on about how superficial it is to say that I am a Christian tonight. But I take a different approach to that. I love it. I feel like it speaks truth. That we all have moments where the music is playing and we really believe it all. It's not to say we don't believe it at other moments, and certainly Mark Cohn is a man who is, in fact, Jewish, probably isn't a Christian, but, but caught up in that moment, you just believe. And the backstory behind this, this song is that he was down there and this, this woman, Muriel, this is a real person, they were trying to sing some songs together and realized that while they were both musicians, they didn't know any of the same music at all. And they were finally able to come together, belting out Amazing Grace. But we do have those moments, don't we, where, where the music just starts 
and we just feel something. Something big happens in, in us. I, I know we're all kind of anticipating some of those songs next week with Easter, right? I mean, I know as the, the organ, you're, are you playing organ next Sunday, Pam? I don't know if you're planning it or not, but as the organ starts rolling around and getting into Christ, the Lord is risen today, and, and those chords start, I feel the resurrection. And if we're and, and I know you're not doing the Alleluia chorus, but those that those opening chords of Alleluia chorus, whenever they happen, whether it's people singing it at Christmas or singing it at Easter, I just I just feel that music. It it, it gets something going within me. It happens when we have Oh Come All Ye Faithful or Oh Holy Night on Christmas Eve too, and um, there's other hymns too, right? Um, I, I get the chills every time we sing, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever. You know what that one is? That's from A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I love those lyrics. There are times when the words and the music come together and we just feel that that power, that love, just sort of welling up in us. It's like being in love, right? We've all been in love if we've lived long enough. No need to look at the person sitting next to you if you're with someone that you're married to. Even if, if you never had a, a long-term relationship, you had something at some point in your life where you just really liked some other person, and when they walked in the room, you had these feelings, those feelings of being in love. And that's something to celebrate, isn't it? And right now, in, in our passages today, it is clear that there are people who are in love with Jesus. They are in love with the guy. They are cutting down branches and laying it down before him as he comes along the road. They're taking their cloaks, putting him down on the side of the road. These aren't people like me who have a wardrobe full of clothes and could stand to put a few of them down in the road. These are people that had, had one tunic and one cloak and they're laying it down in the road for him to walk by on. And, and then in the passage that Bella read, there is this woman with this costly jar of nard. Nard. This incredibly expensive perfume. And she takes this jar, which could have been sold for huge amounts of money, to feed huge numbers of people, and she breaks it over Jesus' feet. In love. They're in love with Jesus. And being in love is something to celebrate. When, when Jim and I were first together, when we were first dating, when we were first married, being in love meant that I did things that I normally wouldn't do. Like we went back to Pennsylvania. He took me to Altoona to like a train museum because he really likes trains. And then we went to Horseshoe Curve, which is this big curve out in Pennsylvania. It's a, it's a thing if you like trains. And I even went to a Pennsylvania Railroad Historical Society convention. And I liked it. Because I was in love. It took me a couple years to remember that I don't like trains. But in that first, that first exuberance of love, I went and saw train things. Jim went to art museums. Now we've been married for 26 years. Um, we, we often do those things by ourselves. We do other things together, like argue over songs. Um, but, you know, he's going to enjoy trains a lot more if I'm not there with them, and I'm going to enjoy art galleries more if he's not with me, right? We're an old married couple now. But we still remember those times where we were feeling 
in love, that, that excitement. But here's the thing. That in love feeling, it doesn't last forever, right? I loved looking at all things trains for a while. Jim enjoyed learning about art for a while. But we are who we are, and, and we learn to be married with each other, building a life together without having to think everything about the other person is absolutely wonderful. The scales fall from our eyes, and we see each other for the person that the other really is. And if we are so lucky that we can still stay together, love goes from being a feeling to being a verb. Love becomes something you do. Love is something that someone does for you. It is not a thing that you have, that you feel. It's an action that you live out. In love is just not sustaining. And it wasn't for the people in our text today. If we take the crowd as being a character in the Gospel of Mark, the crowd does all sorts of interesting things through the Gospel. This character, the crowd, blocks a man who, who wants healing because they're gathered around Jesus and makes his friends drop him through this roof. This crowd they follow Jesus out into the wilderness because they want more healing. This crowd stands by the side of the road and puts branches and cloaks down the side of the road. And this crowd shouts, crucify him a couple of days later. The lovely palm branch waving feelings that the crowd as a character do on Sunday, have passed away by Friday. In love isn't sustaining. So what is? When we delve into the things that happen between our hosannas and alleluias, when we delve into the stuff of Holy Week, we realize that everybody, not just the crowd, really turned against Jesus in one way or another. Judas here begins plotting to betray him. Peter, when faced with, with claiming that he was with Jesus, denied him not once, not twice, but three times. The others sat at a distance. Only a few women wept at Jesus' feet. All of them Everyone turned on him. And yet, Jesus continued to love. Not in love kind of love, not doing extravagant things like laying down coats and cloaks kind of love that the people were doing, not this fleeting, passing, romantic thing that we have, but true deep God love. When these people betrayed him and beat him and denied him and ridiculed him and shouted crucify him, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Often we talk about the forgiveness of the cross being the forgiveness of our sins in a, a otherworldly sense that, that somehow magically all our sins are forgiven through the death and resurrection of Jesus. But it also happened just in this moment of great love. Jesus, he loved 
these people so much that even though they had turned on him in every way, shape, and form, he still loved them. He still forgave them. And so when we come next Sunday to the Alleluia part of this story, it's important to remember that we go into those dark spaces. God is lifting Jesus up, not from a, the back of a colt that he rode into town, but from the grave. And if we are going to acknowledge resurrection in our own world, in our own life, it falls upon us to pay attention to the whole story. God isn't lifting us up from good places to better places. God is reaching into the deepest, darkest, worst part of our lives and lifting us up and giving us new life and carrying us forward. It is not depressing to go through Holy Week. It is not depressing to look at Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. It is the very thing that our alleluias are built upon. If we are praising God, we need to know what we are praising God for saving us from. We need to be aware of what we are praising God for doing in our lives. So I encourage you, spend some time, whether it's reading the Gospel of Mark yourself, chapters 14 and 15 aren't very long, you could read it yourself or read it aloud as a family, or watching Monday, Thursday online, or coming here for Good Friday services, or the parking lot for Holy Saturday. Work on what it is that comes between Hosanna and Alleluia. Because when we understand that, when we understand the, the mystery of the cross, we also understand the beauty of the empty tomb in ways that we don't when we just pass from celebration to celebration. Let us pray. Holy Jesus, we cannot even imagine the events of Holy Week. We really can't. We have seen pictures and movies, but the horror of it all is, is beyond our understanding. And truly beyond our understanding is how you can still love us so much having gone through what you did. We remember your words of forgiveness. And we are aware of our own unwillingness to forgive. And it chastens us. We have been through a lot of darkness this year, oh God. Maybe not the darkest darkness, but a lot. We have been surrounded by a cloud of loneliness. We have felt death pressing in on all sides. We have struggled sometimes to keep our head above water. Keep a smile on our faith. Keep faith in our hearts. So 
So these Holy Week stories, they're hitting us deep. Betrayal and denial and death, suffering, loneliness. Help us to take a deep breath in and, and feel all that we have felt. Not because we want to keep feeling bad about things, but because we want to really experience the new life that resurrection brings. Help Easter to have new meaning for us this year, O oh God. As we journey through the cross, bring us from Hosanna to Alleluia with the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, beloved, go in grace, go in peace, go in love, for you cannot go where God is not. Amen. <laughs>